This video is brought to you by Squarespace. They don't think of original ideas and they don't bring much culture into their product. It's really easy to imitate the bad parts of Steve of being an Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, the two main faces of the digital revolution. This is the richest man on earth. Apple is going to reinvent the phone. This yin and yang between the two would create a brutal rivalry. The computer business is becoming a monopoly with Microsoft. It's a dark period right now. Profit margin for Windows alone is an astounding 78%. They have violated the Sherman Act. Today, we will explore the nerd wars. All right, so the year was 1955. On two opposite sides of America, little baby Billy grew up in Washington and little Bubba Steve grew up in California. Bill Gates grew up in a very wealthy family, very privileged, he grew up and had great education. Steve Jobs, on the other hand, was adopted as a child to a family that didn't have a lot of money. Bill Gates was your goody two-shoes, you know, he was clean cut, he attended private school and then eventually got into Harvard University. Steve Jobs, on the other hand, took a very different route. He got into Reed University but dropped out after six months due to financial difficulties. From here he would spend time sleeping on the floor of his friend's room where to make money to buy food he would return coke bottles and every week he would get a free meal from his local Hare Krishna temple. <laughs> Steve Jobs' life wasn't going in a good direction. The idea that one day he'd be the CEO of the biggest business on earth was a pretty long shot away. It was more looking like he was just gonna be a homeless dude. Presumably inspired by the hippie generation, in 1974 he went to India in search of spiritual enlightenment, where he would stay for seven months. The minute that you understand that you can poke life and if you push in, something will pop out the other side. That you can, you can change it, you can mold it. On top of spirituality, he experimented with psychedelic drugs. I didn't take as much as he did. All in all, you probably get the picture that Steve Jobs was your classic hippie. The type of person you might find walking through the aisles of Holland and Barrett. But Bill Gates, on the other hand, he was just a nerd. There was nothing particularly eccentric about him. He, of course, wasn't out in India finding spiritual enlightenment. He was sat in the computer room twiddling with motherboards. But you see, be around about the mid 70s where these two very opposite characters would finally encounter each other for the very first time. After Steve Jobs got back from India, him and his friend Steve Wozniak, along with Ronald Wayne, started working on a little business in 1976 called Apple. It's a computer terminal board I'm working on. Hooks up to the TV for the display. Steve Wozniak had a big interest in computers, and Steve Jobs also enjoyed computers, but really enjoyed design. And so they started this business out of the garage of Steve Jobs' parents. Meanwhile, Bill Gates too was starting up his own business with a man called Paul Allen. As opposed to Apple, their company was more focused on software and programming. They had this very early strategy of making very cross-compatible products, computer programs and languages that would work across many different types of machines. This focus on cross-compatibility would be a key part of Microsoft's strategy, a part that Steve Jobs was 100% against. They just make really third-rate products. But despite that, in these early days, Steve Jobs saw something in Bill Gates. And so he decided to travel to meet him. Steve Jobs had reached out to Bill Gates to ask him to make a programming language for the Apple product that they were working on. And so the nerd and the hippie would finally meet in Seattle. The two struck a deal and decided to work together. But of course, Bill Gates wanted to see what it was Apple would do it. And so he was shown some of the very early Apple prototypes. And he thought they were shit. Steve Jobs, being the very charismatic person he was, had definitely talked up the Apple product. We think we're basically fashioning a 21st century bicycle here, which can amplify an inherent intellectual ability that man has to free people to do much more creative work. But Bill Gates didn't really find it very impressive. The development of Macintosh by Apple has been paralleled by the work of leading software developers. But anyway, despite their differences, they went on to work together. And Apple released the Apple too. This product was revolutionary. Steve Jobs' idea was that the product would be completely user-friendly and ready to use straight out of the box. You didn't need to know what you were doing, you didn't need to plug a load of shit into it, it just worked. The real genius of Macintosh is that you don't have to be a genius to use it. And when it went to market, it was an instant success. Shipping six million units, making Steve Jobs and Bill Gates pretty wealthy. And so at this time in the late 70s to the early 80s, the pair were pretty good friends. We're planning that over half of our retail sales next year will come from, from Macintosh software. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Macintosh software dating game. And so this led to a weird moment 
in 1983. Where Steve Jobs, in what I perceive as a power play, brought Bill Gates and a few other CEOs of software companies onto a stage to compete in the Macintosh software dating game. The three CEOs had to basically pitch as to why they were needing to work with Apple and why Apple needed them. But it would be in this show where Bill Gates would publicly express his love for Apple. Well, to create a new standard, it takes something that's not just a little bit different. It takes something that's really new, and the Macintosh of all the machines I've ever seen it is the only one that meets that standard. And so, it seemed that Bill Gates, despite his first encounter with Apple, was pretty charmed by the product. Okay. I know it's not my place to say it. Then shut the hell up, Bill! Steve Jobs' personality is one that has been subject to films, documentaries, and many a review. But his genius comes with a lot of baggage. On one hand, he's described as like this enlightened, free-thinking hippie who took copious amounts of psychedelic drugs. But on the other hand, he was known as this hard-headed, brash, confrontational dictator. He would put his staff under insane pressure if he didn't like someone or someone did something to upset him. With a drop of the hat, he would just burn that bridge and destroy that relationship. What are you gonna be? You gonna fire me? No! I already fired you! But part of this was his genius. The fact that he had such a specific, certain vision of what he wanted Apple to be. He saw technology and computers as more than just simple tools, but rather as pieces of art. You've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. We've dramatically decreased the number of components necessary on the motherboard. And he had this obsession with the idea of a closed system. What I mean by that is that the Apple products, as you probably know now, you can't really upgrade them, you can't really change them, and they only really work well with the Apple ecosystem. Famously, Steve Jobs even changed the screws on Apple products so that you couldn't open it with a normal screwdriver. You needed a special Apple screwdriver to do it. And this was a deliberate idea from Steve Jobs. But this vision, was the complete opposite of the overall tech industry. Bill Gates represented that style of thinking. You know, the open system that everything works together. Your keyboard, your mouse, your operating system, all different companies, it all works together. Happy days. But anyway, for Apple in the 80s, things were going really well. This is number a million of the Apple IIs, and that'll probably seem small in a couple years. But then, disaster struck. Her name is Lisa. And she's the most exciting thing to happen in computers today. A lot was riding on this release. They wanted to see if Steve Jobs was just a one-hit wonder, or if he could keep it up and keep making amazing innovative products. And so during development of the Apple Lisa, Steve Jobs asked Gates if he could create programs for the Lisa. Gates said yes, but in order for him to do it, he wanted a prototype of the Apple Lisa. And so Steve Jobs sent him one. Why wouldn't he? Gates received the Apple Lisa, he turned it on, and he was stunned. Before we go further with this video, I want to give a massive shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring. Squarespace is the ultimate website building platform. It's cost effective, it's simple to use, and your website will look beautiful. In this day and age, if you're a freelancer or you're creating your own business, you really do need not just a website, but a very professional looking one that's easy to use and will make your customers have trust in your quality of your work. Lucky for you, Squarespace can do that all for you. With tons of templates to choose from, you can pick any of them, customize them exactly how you like to fit whatever it is you do, and bang, you got your have a nice website. It's simple, it's easy to use, and it comes with tons of built-in features too, like email marketing, e-commerce, appointment scheduling, and many more. So be sure to check out Squarespace at squarespace.com forward slash Jimmy the Giant, and to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, use the code Jimmy the Giant. Anyway, back to the video. You see what I mean about the screen? It's very graphic. Here's a place to store information. The innovation that was coming with the Apple Lisa was a thing called a GUI, a graphical user interface. Files, folders, mouse pointers. It was revolutionary. And Bill Gates knew it. I can create and combine words, numbers, charts, and pictures virtually in seconds. On the 19th of January, 1983, Steve Jobs released the Apple Lisa. There was tons of hype, tons of build up to this product, and it completely flopped. In total, it only ever shipped 10,000 units. And so while Steve Jobs and Apple were panicking, Bill Gates decided that this would be a pretty good time for him to announce his Microsoft product. Their very own Windows operating system with its own GUI called Windows 1.0. 
As news got to Steve Jobs, he demanded that Gates come and meet him. And Steve Jobs just went in on him, shouting at him that you're ripping us off and saying that he trusted him. And then Bill Gates calmly responded, Well, Steve, I think there's more than one way of looking at it. I think it's more like that we both had this rich neighbor named Xerox and I broke into his house to steal the TV set and found out that you had already stolen it. You see, there was slightly more to this story than Steve Jobs was letting on. Back in 1979, Steve Jobs and Apple were invited to Xerox Park where he got an opportunity to see what they were working on. The world's first GUI. Steve Jobs saw this and took inspiration from him and used it on his Apple product. Basically stealing the idea from Xerox. Exactly what he was accusing Gates of doing. You are your own worst enemy and this company's. Anyway, whilst this was going on, things really weren't looking good for Steve Jobs at Apple. Steve Jobs had actually recently employed a person by the name of John Scully to take over like business operations. But this might have been a bad decision from Steve Jobs. Him and Scully were often clashing, particularly over the Macintosh and the Lisa product, due to its failure to live up to expectations and its terrible sales. It seemed like Steve Jobs and Apple really were struggling to live up to the hype that they had built. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Their marketing and their perception was that of a really innovative brand. In 1984, they won an award for their incredible Big Brother advert. Wanted to show a uh, problem that my Apple Lisa has. But yet the products weren't really backing up the vision. That's actually something that I wanted to talk to you about, Steve. I've been asking for the fonts for months. On top of Sully and Jobs not getting along, also it was becoming very clear that a lot of the people working at Apple weren't really in love with Steve Jobs' management style and pretty much create a very hostile work environment. And so, in 1985, all of this would come to a head. Steve Jobs publicly resigned from Apple. And so whilst Apple and Steve Jobs' life and career was just in flames, Bill Gates, on the other hand, was just sitting pretty. Life was good. Your picture has been on the cover of virtually every major news magazine. It really did just seem that this straight-laced nerd that was Bill Gates was completely beating out this supposed visionary, which was Steve Jobs. And Jobs wasn't very happy about it. The only problem with Microsoft is they just have no taste. They don't think of original ideas and they don't bring much culture into their product. But despite this, Gates was winning and Jobs' career was definitely on the ropes. By 1987, at just age 31, Gates became the world's youngest billionaire. His company was breaking financial records, and in 1995, Bill Gates became the richest man on earth. <laughs> Jobs, on the other hand, had had another failure. His new company, Next Computing, was an absolute disaster. However, he did start to have a turn of luck when he acquired a company called The Graphics Group, and they were working on CGI. They ended up partnering with Disney to create the now iconic film, Toy Story. This company would go on to be known as Pixar. Meanwhile, his darling company, Apple, that he didn't work at anymore, they were on the brink of bankruptcy after effectively having no successful innovations since Apple II. And so in 1997, Apple made a controversial decision to rehire Steve Jobs in a last ditch effort to save the company. Apple purchased Steve Jobs' next computing company for 429 million. Obviously, to most of us, that's pretty good money. But for Steve, he was quite far behind Bill Gates. But Steve was playing the long game. For Bill Gates and Microsoft, he had released Windows 95. This was, again, another monumental success, but his success had actually started to cause a problem. They are currently over 95% market share in both of those markets. By every measure, they are a monopolist. By every measure, they have violated the Sherman Act. Windows had done so well that they had basically become a monopoly. And they were faced with the very real possibility of being broken up. This led Bill Gates to make a very unexpected decision. In 1997, just as Apple were about to go bankrupt, he invested $150 million into Apple, effectively saving them from bankruptcy. And I'd like to uh, announce one of our first partnerships today, a very, very meaningful one. And that is one with Microsoft. In this strange twist of events, Steve Jobs was forced to do a press conference, you know, to thank Billy Boy for the for the money. And to the legion of Apple fans who were still out there for some reason, it didn't go down very well. We have taken a look uh, at browsers out there and Apple has decided... They booed Bill Gates' face when it came up on the screen. And people weren't very excited about the future of Apple with partnership to Bill Gates. However, this would lead to 1998, with Steve Jobs' first product from his return called 
the iMac. And it was an instant success. Look, I'm really pleased to report to you today that Apple's back on track. In terms of sheer numbers, Microsoft was still dominated, but Apple was starting to carve out a little niche for themselves as a producer of innovative, design-centric, high-quality products. In 2001, Apple would release the iPod, another major success, but this time, it started to change the competitiveness between Microsoft and Apple. And we think that this is the best way to manage your music on the planet. The iPod along with the iTunes Store completely revolutionized music. And so Microsoft was starting to feel this a little bit and they released their competitive product in 2006 called the Zune Media Player, which not a single person gave a fuck about. Again, in 2007, Apple would change the world with the iPhone. We really believe that, that a device like this, which is vastly easier to use, is the future. This became the new standard for smartphones. This new arena became a problem for Microsoft. They tried the Windows Mobile and later the Windows Phone operating system and they were pretty unsuccessful. Microsoft went from sitting on its throne to now kind of scrambling to keep up with Apple and all its new innovations. This all led us to 2007 where Bill Gates and Steve Jobs would be seen publicly sat together in a live conference. So let's get started. Um, I wanted to ask, there's been a lot of like mano a mano catfight kind of thing in a lot of the blogs and the press and stuff like that. A lot of people wondered how this meeting would go down. Considering their very complicated past and their rivalry, it came as a surprise to some to see that they had very genuine appreciation for each other. Well, you know, Bill built the first software company in the industry and that was huge. That was really huge. You know, despite taking a few light-hearted jabs at each other, there was a clear respect. First, I want to clarify, I'm not fake Steve Jobs. Uh... <laughs> this legendary rivalry had gone from bitter and ruthless... So that when I'm finished, you can still see through those thick pretentious glasses, you psychopathic, unimaginative criminal. To now an understanding of the role that each other presented to the tech industry. It is the single deadliest form of cancer, one so many familiar names have faced in recent years. However, I would also be around this time where Steve Jobs was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And being the hippie he was, he refused any medical intervention initially. And soon everybody is telling him, quit trying to treat it with all these roots and vegetables and things, just get operated on. But he does it nine months later. Gates visited Jobs whilst he was in a very ill state. In his final months you came to his house came in through the kitchen and the two of you spent a couple hours together reminiscing and, and really made peace however in october 2011 steve jobs died you know he believed in revolutionary ways of using computers just before steve jobs had passed on august 9th 2011 and we are calling it iPhone. Apple's sales have increased 80% this year. Apple had reached the milestone of being the richest company on earth. I'd like to take a moment and thank everybody in the Apple community. Since Steve Jobs' death, Apple has retained that position for a good chunk of those years. With the number two position, as you probably expect, to being Microsoft. Bill Gates, to this day, still speaks very highly of Steve Jobs. It's incredible what this rivalry of two people created. Their differences forced them to sharpen their own swords and become better, to work harder and create better products. And the pair will leave a mark on the world forever. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can, you can build your own things that other people can use. That's maybe the most important thing. Rest in peace, Steve Jobs. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel and watch this video right here.